I've definitely thrown my jeans in the freezer before. No, you know what it does? It freezes the bacteria and then when it thaws out, they smell again. Yo, what's going on everybody? Welcome to Make It Happen, episode three. You guys already know what this series is about. So in this video, we're gonna be meeting three people. One, we got Esther, who's a really dope female chef who's busy with her third location. And then we got Andrew, who co-founded one of the most respected Japanese denim brands in the game. And then we got Victor, who is just starting to make his mark in the luxury shoe world with his Italian sneakers. And as you guys know, this series could not happen without Wix, who's helping businesses large and small get amazing websites super easy. Check this out. All right, so we have finally made our very, very helpful website through Wix, and the name of it is, I told you I was gonna reveal it to you guys, theaziancreatives.com. Now, I know that it's not only for Asians, uh, but the reason why we made this site is because so many people ask us looking to connect or find other Asian influencers or creatives, whether that be uh, Instagrammers, photographers, videographers, designers, whatever. So basically, this is like a public database where you can submit your information, get seen, get spotted. It was just really, really easy to make. So this website was a really cool design and I didn't know I could do this so easily through Wix. It's a site where you can submit your social media or public portfolio work and it'll show up on the site for everybody else to see. And it's basically just a collective for people who wanna work in the industry or get noticed and get categorized as a creative so that they can be found and seen. So definitely check out Wix yourself by clicking on this link down below. Whether you're building a site for yourself, a collaborative site like we did, a restaurant, you're a photographer, you're selling something, you're a comedian, whatever it is, Wix is super easy. Like if you think about how complex the website is that we made, where it's like a database where people submit their information and then it shows up. I mean, you know how much coding I would have had to do, but I didn't have to code at all. I just dragged and dropped and it looks great. Yo, Wix has been super useful and super easy to use, so definitely you guys gotta check it out. Just click on the link down below and try making your first website. All right, so I'm gonna finish up here at this cool cafe called Kodawari in the Lower East Side, but you guys check out the rest of this, make it happen. Yo, good What's to see up? you, good to see you, good to see you. This is your third location. I don't know if I'm like cool enough for Miss You, you know what so I mean? So you got, you made a spot that makes you cooler. Yeah. All right, let's go try some food and let's talk. Done. Esther, Korean American, you have three locations, two locations of Mok Bar, which is more of like a Korean ramen spot. Mm -hmm. Ramen Fusion, and then you have Miss You. Where are we at? What is this? Yeah, Miss You is, I would say, more like a cocktail bar that serves really awesome food. Okay. And so more almost drinking geared, drink but the food is just to complement the drinks. Of course. And honestly speaking, when we first opened this, we did try to push the food more and be more of a restaurant, huh. but it just like didn't really work out. People just wanted a drink. These are the, some of the dishes that actually survived on the menu. And I say this because... Why are you had... so cynical? <laughs> no, because I was so like... sad. I had all these amazing dishes when I first opened, but it just, if you're selling one a week, it just doesn't make sense to keep it on the menu. Yeah, don't. Right? Yeah. And like chicken feet was one of my favorite things on the menu. And it was like fried chicken wings, but like better. But then people like really freaked out. Anyways, we're not eating chicken feet today. What do we got? These are all your popular dishes. They survived. Yeah. Like this one is based on mac and cheese. No, what is this? Is the tteokbokki? Yeah, but it's duck, duck and cheese. I know that you feel very strongly about kind of revealing and, and showing Korean cuisine to people mm -hmm. in a way they haven't. How has that been working out? I, I would say in New York City, it's definitely possible and people are embracing the idea very much. Definitely is Korean food through my eyes. Do you like the sauce? I like this yeah. a lot because I'm a fan of mac and cheese. Okay. Much from, I think the rice rolls also, these rice rolls are way smaller. Yeah. So it feels like pasta yeah. or a noodle. It's like a mixture. It's like a gnocchi, right? 
A gnocchi? Gnocchi. Oh, I thought it was ganache. No, that's gnocchi. not. Gnocchi, no. I'm gnocchi. totally saying it. You're probably saying it right. Of course, you're the chef. It's the G is silent. It's okay, yes. The G is silent. Mm -hmm. Just like in lasagna. Ganache, wow. Wow. So wrong. Uh, what is it like, one, being a female chef? Is there benefits or negatives that come along with that? So this is a question that I actually get asked quite often. I think that it is different. It's a different experience. Here's my funny thing, and sorry to interject, where it's like, well, I, I don't get why like there's a stereotype where like women should be in the kitchen, and then all of a sudden when it comes to a professional kitchen, they can't cook right? or like stay out the kitchen. That's I'm like, like the weirdest thing ever. I, it just doesn't make any it's sense. It's obviously a man's way of thinking. But it is it is um, a different yeah. journey, I think, for females that are in the kitchen just because physically it is really demanding. I mean, right, that's, you are that's... lifting stuff, hot stuff. Yeah. You're not a extremely tall woman. I mean, look at me. I'm literally 5'1 and I'm 100 pounds. Do, do even some people question your food because you're so small? You're like, oh, how can this girl really know okay. good food because she clearly doesn't eat? First of all, do you know how many messages I get saying like, oh, you're, you don't look like a chef. You are too like little to be a chef. Well, you you're have like to be a too, fat like, man to yeah, be a chef. Yeah, I'm like, what, I have to be like disgusting to be like a <laughs> chef? Like, do I have to be like nasty and sweaty and like piggy? <laughs> Honestly, think about the definition of a chef too. Like, what is a chef? It's someone that orchestrates a kitchen doesn't mean that you're like fucking on the line. Let's say a conductor. Yeah. They're, they're not maestro. sitting there like playing the actual instrument. They're the ones orchestrating right. the entire thing. So it makes it work. And that's what, you know, chefs really do. So you're basically saying you a boss. I got, I got a rep for the bow. Yeah. You know, humility is like really important in what you do. And I think being a boss, it is more important to know where your level is at. Like for me, if I don't know something, I'll freaking ask. I'll be like, I have no idea what you just said. Can you just explain it from A to B, mm -hmm. B to C? Yes, if I can be control freak if I want, but how can I do that for all three restaurants all the time? Being a control freak is even worse and it stresses me out, stresses everyone out, and it just ruins the whole atmosphere. At some point right. you have to dish off the task and give other yeah. people, trust other people. Yeah, and there are other talents and really it's about recognizing talent. Taking it back a second, what advice can you give maybe a young girl right now who's into food, what should she do? Everyone's gonna have a different path, that's like, that's for sure. But you do need to experience all the different things and whatever you do, give it your like 150%. If you decide to get a job and take it, commit to it and do it until you're the very best at it. And then you move on. You know, don't quit in the middle, right. which a lot of youngsters love to quit. Thank you so much for sitting down with me. Andrew, um, lovely to have you. Dude, the, f the food was great. And uh, if you're looking for a spot in the LES with a nice cocktail, and good food. Definitely check out Miss You. Thank you, Esther. I appreciate it. And glad that uh, I feel like this video went better than the first time we filmed together. We have better chemistry this time around. All right. Yo, never a bad time at Miss You's. But that segment was for all the foodies out there and for all the fashion people out there. You're really going to like the next segment, too. Let's go talk jeans with Andrew Chen from 316. Yo, what's going on everybody? I am here with one of the founders of 316, Andrew. Uh, nice to have another Andrew here. <laughs> How would you describe 316 as a clothing brand? We've been doing this for 15 years as of this year. Our primary focus is jeans, men's jeans, and we make what I would say are high quality basics, design them for longevity and maybe hand on to their kids one day. It is true, you know, you buy the fast fashion brands, those are cool, but that stuff doesn't last. This pair of jeans here is three years old. While it might look like a lot of jeans that you can get in a store, they started out super dark. This thigh is starting to melt a little bit, so we just sewed a patch behind it. We sewed it right there on that machine. Yeah. You know, every time it starts to fall apart, we just repair it and keep going. And that's kind of the beauty of the perfect pair of jeans. Once you find them, you can keep them going.
why do a lot of people say that denim or your pants are like the heart of your outfit? They're like, you get yourself a good pair of pants, you can throw on just a basic top, and you're good to go. For me, they're the most important part of my outfit because I'm wearing them every single day. So shoes, I'm switching all the time. Tops, you know, you wear once and then you, you wash them. I, I'm in the same pair of jeans for six to nine months, maybe longer, and then I'll start on a new pair. No one's mad that you wear the same jeans every day, actually. No, because I'm, um, you know, I have, I have good hygiene and, you know, and I wash them often. Um, that's another thing that, you know, when, when it comes to raw denim, a lot of people have been told that you should wait as long as possible before washing them. Yeah, what, um, what's the deal with that? Because I've definitely worn a pair of jeans for uh, way longer than I should have without washing them. Um, a lot of brands started telling customers the longer you wait, to wash it, the, the, be the, the better the better your fades are. And what we found is that the longer you wait, the quicker the fabric is gonna start to break down. And so dirt, bacteria kind of get in there. They also smell, so. Yeah, they you know, definitely, they, and I, I've heard especially that. Especially like today, when it's super hot out and you're just sweating into them and then going all summer long, it's not a good look. So our advice to customers has been like, you don't have to wash them every week, like, you know, socks or underwear or whatever, but wash them when they start to smell. If that's two to three weeks, or if that's like a month or two months, wash them and they'll last a lot longer. I've definitely thrown my jeans in the freezer before and it did not do what I thought it was. No, you know what it does? It freezes the bacteria and then when it thaws out, they smell again. So. Cause I don't think that the freezer is that cold where it's like. No, it'll just preserve them. They're just, they're hanging out. I was gonna ask you for a piece of advice for a younger guy or inexperienced person that wanted to get into the, particularly the cut and sew game. Try and meet people and put yourself out there. You're gonna learn a lot through the process and see if it's for you. It's okay to go through an internship and realize that this is not your passion, right? You just learn about yourself, meet other people, but just try. We made jeans that made sense to us and we let the market come to us. And so right now, if you're asking about our target demographic, it's male, 25 to 35. But I will say that at Self Edge, we have 15, 16 year old kids who come in, like they've wow. saved up for a long time and this is their first great pair of jeans that they're buying. And then we've got 60, 70 year old guys that buy from us and they're telling us that these are the jeans that they had when they were growing up and they are so thankful that there are people that are still making jeans that way. So it really runs the gamut. So a lot of brands start by using a larger company, possibly a luxury brand's overstock yeah. material. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. yeah. And, and the other thing that a lot of brands do is they'll start out using stock fabrics, which are when you talk to a mill, there are certain fabrics that they're running year round. You have ready access to it. You don't have to hit any minimums. Um, and you could just buy like 100 yards or something and you can ship it over and make a few jeans out of it. But when you get to the point where you want to customize the textile exactly to what you want it to accomplish, then you move on into custom fabrics. And that's a really scary thing for a small brand to do because you have to commit to really high yardages. Yeah, they won't stop the loom to make a little bit, right? So they have to, they have to make a certain amount. Dude, I'm telling you, Andrew, you are breaking down the denim <laughs> game. And I, I was actually in IT consulting for seven years before starting 316. Um, so you you did I did the traditional the, career route, the, um, the yappy route. Yeah, and I and I and I started 316 about three or four years into that day job. But oftentimes I, people burn out from the consulting. Absolutely, jobs. that's that's where I was at. When other people would go out and have meals together and whatever, I'd be like, I'm just. And they're like, Andrew, happy hour, and then yeah. you're like, I'm good on that. I'm gonna go look at Japanese fabrics. <laughs> Did you get the tattoos uh, before or after you started 316? After, after I got, I started getting tattooed pretty, <laughs> pretty late in life. Is it when you started the, the cool business? <laughs> Yo, everybody, that was an amazing talk. Andrew, thank you so much for your insight, the history, even a lot of the terms you use, man, I'd never thought so much about denim and I actually learned a lot and hopefully, you know, a lot of people out there took some good advice away. All right, everybody, we are on the border of Bed-Stuy and Clinton Hill in Brooklyn right now. And we are about to meet up with my friend Victor, who is the founder of Facto Shoes. Now, as you guys know, we like sneakers, we're in the shoe game and he's in the shoe game heavy, but not even as a reseller and not really in the hype sneaker game like you think. He has a luxury shoe brand. Let's go check out his office and talk to him about 
what it means to be in the sneaker game, but on a different level. All right, we are here with Victor from Facto Shoes in his studio in Brooklyn. How Thank you? you, man. Good, man. Thank I'm... you for coming by. Give us the quick background. If you can describe to us Facto Shoes. One of the main, main things for me about doing this brand was doing something that I would consider to be timeless. I realized when I hit, I think it was 34, I have a passion for sneakers. I have a love of shoes. But I don't want to look like a 34-year-old guy trying to look like I'm 20-something but I wanted to create something for that guy who is trying to transition from younger to older gracefully and stylishly without looking like some old like guy. Somebody can make a good product, but to actually be successful, it takes so much branding and marketing. I mean, that's fashion in general. There's a lot of good stuff out there, but no one sees it. That's the crux of the art form of brand building. The notion is that as long as you make something really good and you put it out there, people will buy it. That's, that's not true. It's not true. That's the blessing and the curse of social media. You have access to perfect. Well, you have feedback and data right away. You know, this discovery process is much more accessible now than it ever been before, but it can also create a very generic group thought sense of what's that, that's a lot of the criticism right now is that as much products as there are out in the world due to social media and clout and likes people are just kind of doing the same things you're taking beach photos you're buying yeezys you're buying off-whites that's the main thing i've learned about doing this business product is necessary to get you to the starting line if you don't have good product if your stuff is made poorly you're not even starting oh, okay. the race you're not even in the game. You're not even in the game yet. Without the right mind to brand it, market it, reach the tribe you're trying to speak to, define who you're trying yeah. to speak to, then your stuff will go nowhere. And that's that's the amazing thing and the challenge of what modern marketing and social media has, has done to the game. If you love this business, it's just another element of it you have to contend to it. More of a business question. How do you get your brand or your shoe into a store like Kith or Saks, where they have been? This business is extraordinarily people-driven. With Kith, I had a relationship with Ronnie from when he was a buyer for a store called David Z. We met earlier on and you know I watched him do amazing things with his career and we kept in touch. When I launched Facto, he's one of the first customers I contacted. It was just a matter of having been in the industry for such a long time. A lot of it is just, okay, I, I want to sell at, let's say, Bergdorf Goodman. I have to find out who that buyer is and put together a good lookbook and send it over to him. Last question I want to ask you is how has being Asian mattered in what you've done? This is the interesting thing. You know, when I launched this brand, I was living in Japan. And when I came back to the States to meet the customers, they appreciated that sort of Japanese background. When I launched the brand, I was just thinking, I'm only gonna sell this to Japanese customers. This is, this is who my target is. This, these guys, these older guys I'm hanging out with that are super stylish, this is for them. Interestingly enough, the Japanese buyers were not as quick to get on this as the American buyers. Why? Here's an American-born Chinese guy making Japanese-inspired shoes and selling it in Japan. There's no exoticism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no travel. It's not as you know. special to them. It's you're coming to my culture, being right. inspired by it to sell it back to me. A couple months after I moved back to New York, I get a call from best department stores in Japan, and they want to do a pop-up shop now. So, do you think it's the New York bump? Because Japan still looks up to New York. They 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 have a fascination with American culture. Oh yeah, definitely. Well, uh, I want to end it off with just a piece of advice to people out there and figure out like I'm passionate about design or something creative. What should I do? <laughs> the most important thing for me is to kill your ego. You know, everyone talks about using stories to, to sell your, your goods, your products. But you're not at the center of the story. Your consumer is. It's not about you. You're there to be the guide, 
to take this guy or girl or whomever from one place right, to yeah. another. I think it's so typical that everybody thinks, well, I'm a brand, I should be expounding about how great my brand is, then people will like it. No, nobody, nobody really cares. People wanna know, what is this gonna do for them? How is this gonna change my life? How, how is this gonna make me feel? Yes, what's it gonna do for me as a person? So you think about the customer, think about how you're affecting them. How you can change their lives. And that's that's the greatest thing you can do. Trying to make stuff because you like yourself. It's it's a it's a pointless exercise after a while. Yo, Victor, thank you so much, man. That was a that was a good talk. I thought it was really insightful. And people definitely, I mean, I understand shoes even a little bit better. And I hope you guys out there do too. This is the end of episode three of Make It Happen. This is Facto Shoes. Check them out. And until next time, we out. I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, I get kind of this like uh, zen vibe from you. A little spiritual I, guy. I would say so. I feel like you can get real philosophical about your shoes. Yeah, Ken, you don't want me to. <laughs> I don't know if we have enough time for that, but I, I, I can tell, I see it. In, I see it.